baryon violation as their source of uh, baryon violation. And leptogenesis is very popular because it, uh, it doesn't really need any new physics other than what we like to assume for the origin of neutrino masses uh, through uh, the seesaw mechanism. And so, as you probably know, uh, the way that works is you couple to the left-handed leptons and the Higgs doublet a heavy right-handed neutrino. Uh, with generation indices i and j. And t the twiddle here is the usual uh, i tau 2 Higgs star. <laughs> and we will assume that these are Majorana neutrinos with a, uh, a mass matrix that without loss of generality we can diagonalize. And so uh, these are presumed to be very heavy sterile neutrinos. And when you integrate them out, you get the Weinberg operator, uh, which is, is this one. Uh, and so uh, <coughs> that, it, well, in formulas, uh, that's this operator. So it's L bar left Higgs twiddle. Higgs twiddle transpose L conjugate left. And then uh, the generation indices are soaked up by this neutrino mass, well, <coughs> generate uh, this combination of couplings, Y nu M inverse, Y nu transpose. And then when uh, the Higgs field gets its VEV, then we see that this leads to a neutrino mass matrix. So it's a Majorana mass matrix for the light neutrinos proportional to the Higgs VEV squared and this uh, product of matrices. Okay, so, uh, and uh, well, the cross in that heavy uh, neutrino propagator it means that there's an insertion of the neutrino mass. Uh, whenever you have Majorana neutrinos expressed in this four component language and you see a clash of lepton number, you know that there had to be an insertion of this. This is a lepton violating. This is the only lepton violating operator in, the, uh, in this theory. And uh, since it's proportional to the mass, you know it has to enter. Uh, why is it coming as 1 over mass? Well, that's because when you rewrite the propagator as p slash plus m over p squared minus m squared, you get m over m squared. I'm sorry, it, the little m is the neutrino mass matrix. So those are the light neutrinos. And the big m is? The heavy sterile neutrinos. Yeah. Okay. Well, so this toy model I was showing you last time is uh, actually a nice warm-up for leptogenesis. And, uh, well, of course, the reason it's called leptogenesis is that uh, we're not trying to initially generate a baryon asymmetry directly. Instead, the uh, heavy neutrinos are going to decay out of equilibrium, and they will generate a lepton asymmetry. The sphalerons will then partially convert that to a uh, so heavy N decay, that generates a lepton asymmetry, and the sphalerons will want to uh, equilibrate that as much as possible and share it with the baryons. And so there's some complicated formula, but uh, roughly, speak, roughly speaking, you'll get a baryon asymmetry, which is order one-third of the lepton asymmetry when you, you work out all the chemical equilibrium conditions. And the picture of how that happens, so it's just like the toy model that, uh, that we had before. Uh, so we have the tree level decay and these two possible contributions uh, at one loop. And in each case, it's possible for these particles to go on shell. 
So heavy nutri, because it's the same. It's just a lepton and a Higgs in the intermediate state. Uh, so that means that we're going to get an imaginary part from the loop diagram like we need so that the interference with the tree uh, gives us a CP asymmetry between uh, decaying into uh, leptons or anti-leptons. And you can... Uh, like, I, like it was before, it means that you have a clash. If you, follow, if you follow the arrows, I didn't put the arrow here, but I want to have the same arrows here. There's a clash of arrows, and so that has to be soaked up by insertion of the neutrino mass. And so for the jth, uh, the K of the jth heavy neutrino, one can work out what is the CP asymmetry, and uh, the formula looks like this. And you can find this all in nice review articles by <coughs> uh, Buchmiller and Plumacher, for example. So the unremovable phase is coming from our neutrino mass, or from the Yukawa couplings. So we have a y dagger y quantity squared. Um, and in the denominator coming from the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the tree level decays, we just have something that's real. So it's y dagger y uh, jj component. And then there's some loop function that depends on mass ratios of uh, the neutrino that's decaying versus the other neutrinos that are in the, in the loop. And uh, this, this sum is over the other neutrinos because you can, you can see that the same neutrino does not contribute to its own uh, epsilon CP asymmetry. And another thing you can see from this is that you need, so I, I kind of implicitly assume that there's three generations of sterile neutrinos, but you don't have to do that. But from this formula, you can see that there has to be at least two. If there's only one, then I is equal to J here, and this is, this is real once again. So you need at least uh, two of these uh, to get CP violation. Let's see. So uh, there's a, a kind of well, so the value, so, yeah, let me say, uh, first of all, that uh, this is for any of the neutrinos decay, but typically it's the lightest neutrino that gives the biggest contribution. And that's because of uh, washout processes, which tend to destroy, or at least dilute, the asymmetry that you make from uh, the decay of any one neutrino. So here's a, well, I'm redrawing everything that I already, no, I, I guess I didn't draw that one. Okay. So here's an example of a uh, process that violates lepton number by two. It's a scattering, delta L equals two. Scattering, we convert a lepton to an anti-lepton and so if you make any lepton asymmetry, these kind of processes tend to wash it out. And you see that uh, the lightest neutrino is going to be the dominant uh, thing in here because uh, it's the least suppressed. And so typically, if you have very hierarchical right-handed neutrinos, uh, the decays from the heavy ones are going to tend to get washed out. Their, their asymmetry will get washed out by this one. And therefore, uh, N1 decays typically dominate in the production of the asymmetry. So that's a nice simplification. Now, of course, there's a lot of model dependence here because uh, we know the neutrino masses and mixings, but uh, that doesn't pin down all the elements of the Yukawa matrices. And so, Yes? What's the order of operations for the imaginary and squared? So is that the imaginary component of the square or yeah. the square of the imaginary component? Yeah. Thank you. So 
minus sign for y p by y p. That's just what you get. Um, it's like I said. There's a a network of chemical equilibrium equations corresponding to the sphaleron being in equilibrium. And uh, so you have to work it out. This is really some more complicated number depending on generations, but uh, of order of magnitude, yeah. Does the fact that the baryon asymmetry is negative lepton asymmetry mean that if you have a more baryons than anti-baryons, you'll have more anti-leptons than leptons? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that would be the case. And so there, yeah, there will be a small lepton asymmetry left over uh, the at, the, at the end. Uh, and therefore, if you could, if we could see the cosmic background uh, neutrinos, we would be able to see that. Okay. Yes? It's not happening directly. Uh, it's uh, the heavy neutrinos are uh, taking part in leptogenesis, and that's giving us radiogenesis. Is that what you said? Right. We're we're producing a leptine asymmetry first, and then the sphalerons see that and they say, "Oh, I don't want it to just be leptine asymmetry. I want it to be, you know, shared amongst all species as much as possible, uh, because that's higher entropy uh, state. So it will." The, the lepton asymmetry will bias the sphalerons to produce to reduce the lepton asymmetry as much as possible, and that will produce a baryon asymmetry of the same order. That's that equation, y b is minus one third y l. Okay, uh, I'm just uh, not able to understand the connection between like how lepton asymmetry can give rise to baryon asymmetry. It's this this phaleron diagram that I I wrote before. Think of it as being a Feynman diagram. So we got nine quarks coming in and we we've got three leptons coming in and so if I start out in a situation where I only have an excess of leptons here uh, just by simple thermodynamics you, you see that that's not going to minimize the free energy of the system at once it's going to drive it's going to drive this reaction until there's some kind of equilibrium on, on both sides Just in neutrinos that we wouldn't notice, or would we actually get more positrons and electrons? No, because, I mean, uh, well, we know the universe is electrically neutral. Yeah. So for every proton, there is an electron. And there's, there's no antiprotons, there's no positrons except those that get occasionally produced by cosmic rays. Yeah. So, well, like I said, this looks like it's going to produce the, the, the lepton asymmetry being opposite direction. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you have charge neutrality of the universe. So if we look today, we're not going to see E plus, E minus imbalance. We'll see neutrino, anti-neutrino imbalance. Okay, so we'll up, okay. Yeah. So uh, even though it's hard to predict this in general, a, a bound was uh, derived by Ibarra, Ibarra and, and Davidson by just varying over parameters and they showed that in magnitude this uh, epsilon parameter for the light, lightest neutrino has to be less than m1 over v squared times the mass difference between m3 and m2. And these are the light neutrino masses and if it, they're hierarchical uh, then we know approximately how big that is because this is the heaviest neutrino of this order 0.05 eV uh, and so then you can write this as being less than the mass of the heavy neutrino over 2 times 10 to the 16 uh, GeV. So that starts to give you an idea of how, how heavy should this uh, the lightest of the, the sterile neutrinos be. So did, did M1 go from being the light, lightest normal neutrino to the lightest sterile Big neutrino? M is the sterile neutrino, little m is the... Okay, I wasn't sure if it started in the equation of 
Okay. Yeah, that's that first M1 is Yeah, I tried to make it, but I'm, I've run out of. What's V squared? I feel like I'm just blanking. Oh, uh, that's the Higgs VEV, so V is 246 GEV. Yeah, I wish I had some more normal sized chalk here. I would be able to, well, maybe I do. I will be able to write more legibly with this. This is a mathematical bound that follows from that formula. Now, uh, in order to find quantitatively the, uh, the actual lepton asymmetry that's going to come out, you need to s solve the Boltzmann equations. And these turn out to have a form where you just consider the couplings, uh, well, you just have to consider the abundance of the, the lightest sterile neutrino and the abundance of lepton number. So you get coupled, equa coupled Boltzmann equations. And schematically, they can be written in this form. Um, and I'll tell you what these symbols mean. So. As usual, uh, it's of the form something times the neutrino density minus its equilibrium density. Whereas for lepton number, this, like in our previous example, this will depend on the decays. So D, uh, D is the decay rate. I'll just write it here. So D is the decay rate. And uh, just like we had in our simple examples before, it's the CP asymmetry times the decay rate, and then uh, that depends on the, uh, the same combination of the heavy neutrino. And the term that we didn't put in before because we were being kind of sloppy was the term due to washout. So uh, w, that's the, exactly the rate of those delta L equals 2 uh, scatterings. And for any uh, out of equilibrium decay scenario, you should put that in. Uh, I was just being uh, sloppy before. And finally, uh, there's, uh, there's S. So S is equal to the delta L equals 1 scattering rate. So that's another thing that can change, just like the decays change, uh, um, sorry. The decays are able to, well, let me just write down an example of that. So you have neutrino lepton doublet scattering of Higgs via Higgs into something without lepton number, say a top, top quark pair. Okay, so that's, this is delta L equals one uh, scattering. And so one needs to just compute those rates, solve these equations numerically. It couples, no, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, I guess it depends, you know, whether this is a lepton or an anti-lepton. But I mean, the rates of those are are the same, so it doesn't matter. The Yukawa coupling is too small okay. to matter. Now, how does the out of equilibrium, yes? Um, why is the S never show up in the sign of equation? Uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, you would think it should show up there. Because uh, it does change lepton 
let's see. Uh, you would think so. So I will have to uh, look that up and get back to you. No, I can tell no. you go to one process should be including the washout process. So it's part of that. Both. Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's true. Uh, maybe that's true. Yeah, probably. I'll I'll, I'll look that up. So, what about the out of equilibrium uh, requirement? And so that can be uh, encoded by something called an effective neutrino mass, which is written uh, with a twiddle. So it's V squared over M1, <coughs> Y nu dagger, Y nu, uh, 1, 1. But if you remember how the indices went with the Yukawa matrices, these indices refer to indices acting on the sterile neutrino, not on the light neutrinos. So this, this kind of looks like the seesaw formula for neutrino mass, but it's not, it's not really. Uh, that's why it's called an effective mass. So is it just y neutrino plus y neutrino? Should there just be two y neutrino? Dagger. It's dagger. Oh, it's, that's not plus. <laughs> it's dagger. Thank you. Um, and so the out of equilibrium requirement, when you work it out, in terms of the Hubble parameter, is that that effective mass has to be less than some uh, equilibrium neutrino mass, m star, uh, which is just some function of, so it's 16 pi to the 5 halves over 3 root 5 root g star v squared over m Planck. Anyway, it's about 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. So if you remember, we had a naive estimate for what kind of a symmetry you would get. Oh, OK, so this is, this is the out of equilibrium requirement that this should be satisfied. And we had a naive estimate of what should be the yield of an asymmetry coming from the decays. And that was just that we would get the asymmetry parameter times the uh, abundance of the original thing that's decaying, which is something of order uh, one over the uh, number of degrees of, of freedom. Now, when you solve the Boltzmann equation, you're going to get something less than that because of the washout. And so a convenient way to parameterize that is to just uh, introduce a an efficiency factor, so kappa is known as uh, an efficiency factor. And by numerically solving the Boltzmann equation and fitting to the results, one finds that if, if, this, uh, if this condition is not satisfied, so of course, Going out of equilibrium, it's not an on-off switch. It's a, it's a parametric uh, dependence. And so you don't literally have to satisfy this condition in order to get an asymmetry. It just says that if you don't, you're going to pay a penalty. Well, it turns out it's kind of convenient to, uh, to not satisfy that condition and to pay the penalty. And so if you consider the case where M1 twiddle is actually greater than 10 to the minus 3 EV, then you can do fits to this uh, efficiency factor, and you get 0.02 times 0.01 EV divided by the effective neutrino mass, approximately. And so now you see what's the penalty that you, you pay when you violate the out of equilibrium condition. And uh, since epsilon 1 doesn't need to be terribly small, 
you, you have you have the room to uh, to pay that that penalty. The reason it's nice is because if you go into this regime, so this is called the uh, strong washout regime. It means those washout processes are having an important effect. It also means that uh, you wipe out any sensitivity of your final results to initial conditions of the universe, such as if there was some initial asymmetry or uh, dependence on the maximum temperature, the reheat temperature. And so people like that because then it allows you to get an unambiguous um, answer. That equation for kappa doesn't hold for the um, effective mass less than 10 to the, or equal to the 10 to the That's equation. right. What's the other equation? That there have? isn't one. You have to solve. And then and depends on initial conditions, like I was saying. Okay. So, uh, so I'll just say there's no dependence on initial conditions in this in this case. Is that not a good thing? It's a good thing. So it is a good thing. I'm saying we want this. Oh, okay. We want yeah. to violate that. Right. Yeah, we want we want that. So now you can put all these results together and you can find that we'll get the right order of magnitude for the baryon asymmetry if we have the following conditions. So the right baryon asymmetry of the universe. We sometimes like to use that TLA. Uh, if the uh, neutrino, heavy neutrino mass is on the order of 10 to the 10, 3 times 10 to the 10 GeV, and if, the, uh, if this combination of Yukawa couplings that appears in the uh, effective mass is uh, order point greater than or order point zero zero two. Now, if you just forget about the fact that this is not a, really a neutrino mass and pretend that this was a diagonal Yukawa mass matrix, then it would be, uh, it would give rise to neutrino mass. And uh, you could interpret this as, uh, as giving you the, uh, as being related to the mass <coughs> difference between M2 and M1. This is the solar uh, neutrino mass splitting of 0 0.0060086 electron volts. And anyway, it turns out that these values look compatible with this uh, observed neutrino mass splitting. And so it all seems to hang together and it makes it look like leptogenesis is a very nice consistent uh, picture of baryogenesis. The numbers that you need to put in agree with what you want to generate uh, the observed neutrino masses. So wonderful. The, the drawback though is that there's just almost, uh, there, there's no way you can think of to test this theory directly because of course these are way beyond our reach in terms of collider physics. Yes? For the way you originally formulated this, you, you, what generates the out of equilibrium requirement that we want to violate? And if it's, there's, a, there's a reason to suppose, to, to have this requirement, how do we justify violating it? Like I said, this requirement is not a hard on-off kind of switch. It's a, it's a smooth curve. If we violate, violate it too badly, then you will underproduce because of this efficiency factor, will go to zero. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to violate it a little bit. Maybe we should talk afterwards. Um, so that's one reason that I've never been a big fan of leptogenesis. Now there's one exception that has been widely studied, and that's resonant uh, leptogenesis. <coughs> And Pilafsis uh, and collaborators have studied this uh, very, uh, very carefully. 
And this is the case where instead of having a very hierarchical pattern of heavy neutrino masses, suppose the two of them are almost degenerate. So you need mi very close to mj uh, for some pair of i and j. Then if you do that, uh, there's a resonant enhancement in that loop diagram. And uh, this function that I wrote as f of mi over mj uh, can be very large. So it's resonantly uh, enhanced. And what that means is that you can get a, a large enough baryon asymmetry by taking mi at the, uh, at the TeV scale. Of course, that means the Yukawa couplings that go into the seesaw formula will be extraordinarily small. So unfortunately, even though we've brought this down to uh, an observable level energetically, uh, we'll still never see it by its coupling to the Higgs. And so instead, what happens is that there are some lepton violating low energy processes such as neutrinoless double beta decay and flavor changing decays of uh, muons, which uh, could be affected by the new physics that you're putting in. Alternatively, if you could, uh, if you build a future E plus E minus or even better mu plus mu minus collider, uh, then that might have the uh, potential to directly produce these um, heavy neutrinos. Okay, so that's all I would like to say about leptogenesis because uh, we still have electroweak baryogenesis. Yes? Oh, I know that, I think there's an experiment at MIT that is proposing some new technology uh, to do that. But, uh, so I, I, I guess some people are optimistic, but uh, I'm not holding my breath. But, uh, you know, Janet Conrad is coming here. I think she... She knows about it much more than I do, so ask her when you get your neutrino lectures. All right, so electroweak baryogenesis, uh, EWBG for short, is a picture where uh, in the early universe, you know, nowadays, the Higgs potential looks like that. But at early times, at, with, the universe was at high temperatures, thermal effects uh, made it look like a, a potential that just gets minimized at the origin. But as you go to some intermediate temperature, then you expect that you might be able to get something like this. And if that's the case, then you would have tunneling which is a first order, leads to a first order phase transition. And then you produce bubbles, you nucleate bubbles of uh, true vacuum where uh, the Higgs takes on its vacuum expectation value, whereas it's still zero outside uh, in the uh, high temperature phase of the universe. These bubbles will eventually all uh, coalesce and complete the, the phase transition. And so this leads to the out of equilibrium uh, condition for baryogenesis because remember this phaleron process is fast out here where the Higgs VEV is, is vanishing. There this, the rate is 10 to the minus 6 times the temperature. Whereas the Svaleron uh, rate is exponentially suppressed because of that barrier I showed you between the, uh, between the vacua, the end vacua of the uh, SU2 gauge theory. So Svalerons are shut off. They're slow. And that's where the out of equilibrium uh, requirement is met 
the, the rate of baryon violation is going out of equilibrium inside of the bubble. But uh, that doesn't happen automatically. Just because you have a first order phase transition is not enough. It has to be strongly enough first order. And the criterion for that is that at, at the temperature where this all happens, and uh, typically that's not just the temperature where these two uh, minima are degenerate with each other. That's called the critical temperature. Uh, instead, the, sup the universe usually supercools a bit before the bubbles actually nucleate. And so this is happening at something called the nucleation temperature. So at T equals T nuke. And this VEV, it's changing as a function of temperature. Anyway, there's a criterion that the Higgs VEV at this temperature divided by Tn has to be greater than about 1.1. That's what you get from solving the Boltzmann equation for baryon violation inside the bubble and ensuring that whatever baryons you made through this process don't get wiped out by sphalerons uh, as, uh, as the universe continues to cool. Uh, and, well, how do you make the baryons? In the first place, uh, we have to have something that's causing the sphalerons to go preferentially in the direction of making baryons. And that is coming from the requirement of CP violation. So we need some kind of CP violating interactions uh, at the wall of the bubbles. And essentially, particles in the plasma are going to be interacting with the wall in such a way as to make any symmetry between particles and antiparticles in front of the wall which is not yet a baryon asymmetry. It's just a CP asymmetry. But as soon as the sphalerons see a CP asymmetry in, in left-handed particles, because it only interacts with the left-handed quarks or leptons, then it'll be just like we had in leptogenesis. Uh, the sphalerons will want to equilibrate that, and it'll drive them in a preferential direction, which uh, necessarily violates both baryon and lepton number. So it's a bit of a complicated story. You need a lot of ingredients. We don't need new baryon violation, but we need new CP violation, and we need a strong enough uh, phase transition, which does not occur in the standard model. And so for that reason, you might not like this theory as much as leptogenesis. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, all the new physics that we put in is happening necessarily at the electroweak scale. If it's happening at a much higher scale, then that's not going to be relevant for the electroweak phase transition. So it means that we have a pretty good hope of whatever new physics we put in here, of seeing it at the LHC. You just said that one of the things here was that the uspicity and CP violating interactions, which are not the standard model. But my understanding is that due to the Sakharov condition, any baryogenesis is going to have to require that. So doesn't the leptogenesis also at some point need that as well? Oh, yeah. So those... Uh, those Yukawa couplings of the neutrino, uh, those are complex. And as you saw in the epsilon parameter, there's some uh, unremovable phase coming from the you know, combinations of those parameters. So strictly speaking, that's not in the standard model because uh, it was defined before we had neutrino masses. But <coughs> and, well, good that you brought up CP violation because well, of course, even in the standard model itself, we do have CP violation. Why don't we just use that? And the answer is that uh, it's too weak. So just a explanation of why is the CP violation in the standard model uh, too weak for our purposes. Uh, we have to formulate what is the invariant combination of parameters uh, that exhibits this phase. And this was done many years ago by Cecilia Yalskog, who uh, showed that the certain in invariant, it's an invariant under uh, phase uh, reparameterizations of the fields of the standard model. So if you take the determinant of the square, I'm sorry, the commutator of the square 
of the up quark mass matrix and the down quark mass matrix. So these are the mass matrices. That turns out to uh, be proportional to the CP violating phase that appears in the CKM. So that's the delta in the CKM matrix. And then we have some other functions which are depending on the magnitude of the CKM matrix elements squared and also differences between the uh, up and the down quark masses squared. The point about this is that, uh, well, this, this determinant, it's, it's over all the families of the standard model. And so it's something with uh, dimension 12. And we're looking in, in baryogenesis for the CP asymmetry, we're looking for a dimensionless parameter. So to make that dimensionless, we should consider J divided by a relevant scale, which in the case of electroweak baryogenesis is the weak scale. So it's V to the, the 12th. Well, the this is, yeah, this is uh, U and D, up and down. Those I could use, the far ones, the F to those. Uh, yeah, these are just eigenvalues, m squared u minus m squared d. So if any, if any up or down quark were degenerate with each other, uh, that would vanish. Um, and so if you plug in the numbers, this is 10 to the minus 20. So no matter how efficient baryogenesis is, and in electroweak baryogenesis, it's actually not typically <coughs> efficient. Uh, that's, that's too small. Now there was a valiant attempt by Ferrar and Shapozhnikov in 1994 to overcome that, uh, but it was shown not to work. And so since then, people uh, concur that uh, CP violation in the standard model is not sufficient. So I'm not gonna say here what the source of CP violation is. That's gonna be your choice in, in model building. I just want to now discuss how it manifests itself in baryogenesis. And so what we need is the interactions of uh, particles with the Higgs field in the bubble wall. And possibly there might be other, another field in the bubble wall like a, a singlet scalar as I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, and we need the interactions of particles in the plasma with uh, the fields that are turned on in the bubble wall to be CP violating. So you can imagine that, say, top quarks scatter more strongly than uh, their antiparticles. That was one of the uh, first ideas for how to do that. Anyway, these, these CP violating interactions we're going to imagine that they produce uh, a CP asymmetry in, in some distribution functions. So think of this as being, say, the distribution function for top quarks versus anti-top quarks. Uh, so e.g. Uh, distribution of T left minus its uh, antiparticle. And so let's draw a picture of the wall. And I'm going to show you some diffusion equations which are or Boltzmann equations which uh, will show you how to to generate such a thing but what you, what you should imagine is that there's some profile of this uh, quantity which is in front of the it's sitting in front of the bubble wall due to these interactions. And now what sphalerons are gonna do is just like what they did for leptogenesis. If this is happening just amongst top, top quarks, they wanna maximize the entropy of the system and share it with all the other quarks. Uh, but uh, since, remember that all the quarks are incoming in this diagram, 
if I want to, if I have an excess in top quarks and I want to share it with up quarks and charm quarks, then I, I have to change the direction of these and put these up and charm in the, uh, I have to put the up and the charm in the final state. So that would become a U bar and a, a C bar, say. So roughly speaking, what's going to happen is that uh, this, this asymmetry in left-handed tops is going to get reduced by a factor of a third. And the one in, uh, in up, left-handed ups is going to be minus a third of that. The minus sign coming from the fact that we changed to antiparticles. And that for charm will also be minus that, uh, minus. So these are left-handed up and charm quarks. But whatever process made this thing in the first place, it can't violate electric charge. And so typically one ex expects that uh, the uh, there's going to be a compensating asymmetry in right-handed quarks, which is equal and opposite to, uh, which is uh, equal and opposite to uh, the one in, in left-handed quarks. But we don't really care about this one because phalerons, uh, to phalerons, right-handed particles are invisible. They only interact with. Uh, things that have SU2 left quantum numbers. <coughs> and so here I s s discover a mistake in my notes, uh, but luckily it doesn't kill us. So now the way that baryons are going to get produced by sphalerons, roughly speaking, it's going to be proportional to the size of whatever CP asymmetry we started with, uh, but we have to now we have to sum over all the contributions from all the left-handed particles in this, and so we see that we get uh, minus a third, minus a third from the light generations, and we get plus a third from from the top, and so you, the important thing is that this doesn't vanish. So this is minus a third. And to make this more exact, we will write down a rate equation for baryon number and, uh, and actually solve that. But this is an order of magnitude estimate. Now in more, in more detail, by the way, I, I finish at noon, is that right? OK. So, now in more detail, how do we get this CP asymmetry? And uh, well, so this is a, a big bone of contention in the electroweak baryogenesis community because two formalisms have been developed which are kind of antithetical to each other. Uh, one is called the closed time path formalism, uh, but it's a bit of a misnomer because the, the formalism I prefer can also be derived from CT close uh, time path non-equilibrium field theory. So the, the, the formalism that I don't like is, is really based on a certain approximation uh, within this uh, CTP formalism, but I, I don't have time to talk about them. I just want you to be aware that uh, there's this split in the community. And my preferred origin of this CP phase can uh, be derived through uh, a semi-classical analysis of what, of how the particles are interacting with the wall. And the simplest example is, again, to think of the top quark. Let me draw, actually I have the picture here of the bubble wall. So that's what, uh, that's what the Higgs VEV looks like. Uh, here's the center of the bubble wall. Here's outside the bubble wall. It has some width. 
And the top quark's mass is just proportional by, via the Yukawa coupling. So we see that the top quark mass is varying inside the wall. And what we would like is not only for its magnitude to vary, as I've shown here, but also its phase. So we would like to have a complex, spatially varying top quark mass. And you can write down the Lagrangian for such a particle. The Dirac Lagrangian as ID slash minus real part. And the I Im imaginary part of the mass comes with a gamma five to make something that's uh, that's uh, this Hermitian. And uh, so if you want, you could reparametrize that combination <coughs> as a modulus, as I've graphed on that uh, slide, times a phase. And the phase is coming with gamma 5. So this angle, theta, is CP violating. It it has to origin, originate from some new CP violating phases in the zero temperature theory. Um, and it gets turned on here in a spatially dependent way when you put the theory in a non-trivial, a spatially non-trivial Higgs background. Now, if you just solve this Dirac equation in the semi-classical limit, so we want to, what does that mean? We want to consider the limit where the uh, momentum of the particle is much greater than uh, the relevant scale here is the inverse wall width. So you know from classical mechanics, if you're doing scattering off of a potential, then uh, the semi-classical limit is, is this one, where you're considering energies that are much bigger than the, uh, than the scale over which the potential is varying. And then you can just solve the Dirac equation in that approximation and get a dispersion relation. And from that dispersion relation, uh, you find out how, for a particle with fixed energy, how is its momentum changing? <coughs> so you'll get P as a function of, of the wall. It's very intuitive. Of course, a particle, as it approaches the wall, uh, it has to lose momentum in order to conserve energy. So there's no surprise there that uh, P is changing as a function of Z. And if that's the case, of course, then uh, there's a force acting on the particle. And you can just derive that from P of Z. But uh, the interesting thing for us is that this phase gives rise to a CP violating uh, contribution to the force. And, I, and when you do this semi-classical expansion, it's an expansion in powers of derivatives. So you find that the force acting on the particle in the wall has the form of a piece that depends on m squared prime over 2e. And that would be there for any particle. That's CP uh, conserving. But for us, the interesting thing is uh, the force that depends on the component that depends on theta. So it actually depends on two derivatives of uh, theta. And then there are higher order things uh, in theta and higher order in derivatives. And this is CP violating, which is denoted by the plus or minus. It means that the force is equal and opposite. This component is equal and opposite depending on whether the particle, its helicity state, so that's the parity, or whether it's particle or antiparticle. So basically, you know, it's, it's CP. Uh, Value. <laughs> Sorry. What's the prime denoted derivative with respect to? You've got prime. Oh, uh, Z. Okay. Z. Yeah. Because you can imagine doing all this in the rest frame of the bubble wall. It's a convenient frame. Well, once you know the force, then you know how to. Uh, derive the Boltzmann equation. Remember, in the Boltzmann equation, 
in its fundamental form, there's this Louisville operator. And the last term in that operator is one which usually we get to neglect in the early universe because there's, uh, there's no interesting forces acting coherently. But in this case, we want to put it in. Is the force pulling the particle inside the bubble? Well, that depends on the sign. Okay. The first term. All you care about is that it's going to be uh, opposite for particles and antiparticles, or, or for the helicity plus or helicity minus. Okay. And so this is the gradient with respect to momenta. So that Louisville operator acts on the distribution function and is equal to the collision term. Now, what we do always to turn this into tractable equations is we integrate over uh, momentum and we turn the uh, F into a density. In this case, what we want to do, we don't care about the overall densities, we care about the difference between particles and antiparticles. So imagine I take this equation for the particle and subtract the equation for the antiparticle and that gives me a small difference, delta F, and the small difference, delta F, for uh, an equilibrium distribution can be related to chemical potential. So there's some chemical potential. Uh, I don't, let's see, I don't think I need, there's a chemical potential. Let's divide by temp temperature. And I'm going to define this dimensionless <coughs> quantity to be equal to uh, C. Uh, so if I just integrated over momenta, then I would get uh, a simpler equation, a Boltzmann equation for this quantity. But uh, in this case, it's important to take into account not only the deviations in the overall number density, but also in the, uh, the velocities of the particles. So we need to take one other moment of the Boltzmann equation and integrate not only over d3p times 1, but also d3p times the velocity of the particles. So the integral over d3p is going to give us uh, something proportional to this variable psi, but if we weighted the distribution by velocity, uh, actually the z component of the, the velocity is the only one that's going to show up when we do this. Uh, and we have to allow for some deviation of the, uh, of the uh, phase space uh, density uh, away from kinetic equilibrium. Then that gives rise to uh, another quantity. Uh, so this is the thermal average of, so this is really the thermal average of the velocity in the z direction times some deviation from, uh, from kinetic e equilibrium. And it just turns out that you need both of these to get accurate. Uh, you can kind of understand it, stand it intuitively because you see that uh, the interactions of this particle with the wall are producing you know, some strange dependence on, on its momentum relative to the usual uh, Fermi-Dirac or Bose-Einstein distribution. Particles are getting reflected and pushed by the wall. And I'm going to define this quantity to be something called U. And so what happens is you get uh, coupled Boltzmann equations, which I think I will, I think I will not write them down explicitly, but they're, they're linear equations in uh, mu prime and u and u prime. Two equations, so you get two coupled Boltzmann equations, uh, and I'll put a little index on here. For each species of particle, 
that's relevant depending on the interactions that are important in your model. So for each species that's uh, interacting with the wall, or which might just be getting produced through other interactions uh, due to the particles that are getting an asymmetry, a CP asymmetry from the wall. And these Boltzmann equations, uh, it turns out that one of them is a homogeneous and one of them is inhomogeneous and there's a source term. And that source term is proportional to this CP violating force uh, and it has the form, uh, well it's, it's, uh, it's proportional to m squared theta prime prime, just as you would expect from that formula. It also turns out to be proportional to the wall velocity. Yeah. Well, it's just because I've taken two, two independent moments of the original Boltzmann equation. So by just integrating over momenta, I uh, get dependence on, on one uh, dependent variable that I'm calling, it's the chemical potential. But this one, uh, that's insensitive to the chemical potential, but it cares about uh, departures from uh, kinetic equilibrium. So this is another, uh, so another feature of electroweak baryogenesis. In the early days, people tried to avoid all of this and, and make order of magnitude estimates, and, and sometimes they still do, but those are very crude estimates. And if you want to do anything quantitative, you really have to write down these equations. There's references in my notes if you want to see where to look it up. And just integrate them numerically and solve for these profiles. So this is, uh, well, so now I can think of this as being uh, the profile for the chemical potential of, say, a left-handed top quark. Uh, and we would have the right-handed top quarks appearing in here as well. And they wouldn't get the source term. Uh, it would just be the, the left-handed, let's see, is that right? No, I'm sorry, they both get the source term. And you have to solve for that profile. And it's numerically a little bit tricky. But once you do that, then you can uh, put them into the Boltzmann equation for a baryon number. And that's the one that's just, the only interaction in that equation is the sphalerons. So people have worked out the precise form of that Boltzmann equation. And it looks like this. So NB time derivative is minus 3 halves times that sphaleron rate that I showed you uh, yesterday. About 10 to the minus 6 t to the fourth. And then some overall generations of all the left-handed particles chemical potentials. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is some over generations. So we have up-type quarks and we have down-type quarks. The three is the color factor. And then we have uh, leptons, uh, electrons or uh, neutrinos. So if you have a CP asymmetry in any of these chemical potentials, it will bias the sphalerons according to that equation. And then you can just integrate it. And so the final baryon number is the time integral of that, but it's more convenient to change variables uh, since uh, time is related to, uh, so if you think about sitting on the bubble, sitting on the bubble wall, uh, as the bubble wall is sweeping through the plasma, uh, time is related to uh, the space in front of the bubble wall. So I can always trade the time variable for, as, for an integral over the, uh, over the uh, direction in front of the 
perpendicular to the bubble wall, which in principle would go from minus infinity to infinity. But since we know that this phaleron rate is actually shut off, or better be shut off inside the bubble, that means we can ignore the contributions that are coming from inside the bubble. And we just start integrating at the position of the bubble wall out into the space in front of the, in front of the bubble. What happened to the usual Hubble dilution is because it's too fast. Uh, oh, okay. No, no, you're right. So, yes. So we could put, to make this more accurate, we could put Hubble dilution. Uh, oh, Hubble dilution. Yeah, PHN. Ah. The left hand side. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's because this is all happening at such a short time scale. Right. You can ignore that. Yeah. Now, there are other dilutions that you can worry about. Like if the wall is too slow, then the sphalerons can actually uh, uh, drive things. They, they can wash out baryon number in front of the wall. But you really need a terribly, an unrealistically slow wall for that to happen. So, can you see in front of is that direction inside the bubble or outside the bubble? Outside. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, now let me just say a few words about how you get a strong enough phase transition. And yeah, this is too bad I have to be so rushed. But you may know that in the standard model itself, you do not get a first order phase transition. Back in the early days of baryogenesis, when people thought the Higgs could be light, then it was possible. And for a Higgs uh, mass of around 45 GeV, it was estimated that all of this would work uh, in terms of the phase transition. But, uh, but for heavy Higgs, it doesn't work. And what people used to focus on to get a first order phase transition was just the thermal contribution to the Higgs potential, which is you can derive just from undergraduate uh, stat mech for uh, a non-interacting Bose-Einstein or Fermi gas. So you just write down all the contributions to the, uh, the free energy uh, of, of the system coming from the particles in the bath. And so this turns out to be, uh, for bosons or fermions, this expression. And well, if you want to include interactions, you could, you could correct this, but uh, they're not usually too important. So sum over all particles who get their mass from the Higgs with the mass evaluated uh, at the value of the Higgs field in that, uh, in that background. Uh, and then uh, what one typically does is to do a high temperature expansion and to uh, just keep the first few terms of, of this. So for T much bigger than uh, the masses, you get uh, terms which look like T squared over 24 mass squared of the Higgs times some number of degrees of freedom for the particle, like it would be 4 for a Dirac fermion. Uh, so that's the lowest order thing. And this is the thing which at high temperature dominates, and it causes the Higgs potential to become just parabolic, symmetric, due to this going like h squared. But the next term in the expansion is the interesting one for, uh, for getting a first order phase transition. And it's the only one that's not analytic. All the rest have uh, integer uh, exponents. And what you can easily convince yourself is that if whatever particle was here, uh, say a gauge boson, had a mass which was purely proportional to h, so then this would be h cubed, then this would lead to a form of the potential at high temperature which could be expressed like this, roughly. And you see that this kind of, so uh, when I expand this, I get, uh, well, yeah, when I expand this, I get 
a term that's linear in H, so it's H cubed, and it's negative, and so it's corresponding to this contribution. And you can see that uh, that form of the potential is the kind of shape I need. It has a barrier. Unfortunately, if you just plug in numbers here, we know what the mass is, masses are for the gauge bosons. Then you can work out what, uh, what this VEV is. And you can show that D over T uh, around this critical temperature is approximately equal to, uh, let me write it as uh, uh, G. So it's equal to 2N G cubed over 8 times 6 pi lambda, uh, where this is the weak. If these are gauge bosons that are contributing, so that uh, n is equal to 6 because we have two polarizations and three kinds of weak gauge bosons. Uh, you get something which is, and this is just the regular higgs yukawa coupling, uh, you get something that's too small. It's 0 0.084. Whereas we needed it to be, we needed it to be 1.1 in order to shut the spellerons down inside of the, the bubbles. And so you can see here why, in the old days, when the Higgs mass could have been light, that would correspond to a small uh, Higgs uh, quartic coupling, then this could have been big enough. Uh, so it doesn't work in the standard model, and you need new, new physics. The new physics could either be particles that contribute uh, more to this term, but that tends to be a difficult way to get it to work. And I'll just briefly mention uh, a more robust way of getting a first order phase transition uh, that I've focused on recently. And that's by adding an extra singlet Higgs. So if you have a, a singlet Higgs such that the full potential is the standard model potential plus a similar uh, Mexican hat kind of potential for uh, the singlet. And then you can have a cross coupling, the usual Higgs portal coupling between uh, the two. The interesting thing about this is that it gives a barrier at tree level if you think about this as being a, a two step phase transition. We're in, so I'll draw it in field space. At very high temperatures, we start out here. Everything's symmetric. So that's very high temperatures. And then as we lower the temperature, we arrange for the potential to be such that uh, we first break along the S direction. And then as you lower the temperature further, we get the electroweak phase transition <coughs> as a second step. And you can easily imagine that this term is producing a, a barrier between these uh, two vacuum because it vanishes at both endpoints, but it's, it's maximum in between. So this tree level barrier gives us a much easier way to get a strong phase transition without relying on these puny sorts of thermal effects that tend to be suppressed. And people are also very interested in this kind of setup for generating gravity waves, but it turns out that uh, Gravity waves, observable gravity waves, and, observ and baryogenesis tend to be mutually exclusive. It's because baryogenesis gets suppressed if the bubble walls are moving very fast. If they're moving at the speed of sound, 1 over root 3, then nothing can diffuse faster than that. And so the CP asymmetry just gets crushed against the wall, and there's nothing, nothing to do. Uh, there's no measure in this integral left to integrate over. Uh, whereas gravity waves like to have uh, very, uh, very fast moving walls. Uh, but there are some, people have found some models with a little bit of overlap. So I'll stop there, and uh, I guess we could take a few questions maybe. Uh, do we always assume the bubble wall thickness is constant throughout its expansion? Or would it um, thinner as the bubble gets larger? I think it's. Uh, for the purposes of baryogenesis, it's, it's constant. Uh, but the thing that is difficult to compute is this wall velocity, because it's actually, those are tied together. 
And to do a totally self-consistent calculation, you need to figure out what's the friction on the wall from all the particles interacting with it. And, and so th that consideration fixes the wall velocity and the, the width of the wall in combination. It's a very difficult calculation that's typically not done self-consistently. Sorry, there is, there is bubbles nucleating all, all over the space, right? But so how do you justify integrating over infinity? Would you be uh, overcounting or getting inside other bubbles? Oh, it's just that so every particle in the universe has to pass through one of the bubble walls. And so uh, if, you just, if you just do it for one, then you're getting good representation of what happens to any given particle in the, uh, in the bath. Um, and well, and I, I think the other statement is that uh, this baryogenesis process completes well before the phase transition is, is over, so you don't have to worry about uh, reaching another bubble wall in your limit of integration. Yeah. Um, so, so in that CP interaction, uh, when you calculated uh, MB, uh, you did take into account the delta FDI. Uh, I think that's the mistake in the The delta F, that's, these chemical potentials are the same as that delta F as I was writing before. Oh, oh, that's because the sphalerons are not influenced by the, the right-handed top. So it's not influenced by any of the right-handed Exactly. Particles? No right-handed particle interacts with sphalerons. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how do we manifest the C violation? I mean, there must be some C violation. Yeah, so that's all coming about at the level where we uh, generate these... Uh, Asymmetries and and so it, it, it's it's at the level of where you get this uh, this spatially varying phase. If you don't have C and CP violation in your fundamental Lagrangian, then you will never get this spatially dependent phase. Yeah. You've got the summation for V sub T of H. You've got plus or minus, and um, what what determines which you remove the plus or whether the particle that you're counting is a fermion or a boson. Okay. And, oh, and I guess I should say only bosons contribute to that cubic term. Yeah. Is the Higgs' his own mass included in that summation? Since yeah, it's, it's there too, but it makes a very small contribution. Just because it's only one degree of freedom? Well, and also... It's the, that lambda coupling is is pretty small. Okay, I guess we can go for lunch then. <laughs>